Hey folks, it's Adam Summer for the Heartland Pod. On this episode, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit special. It's a little bit about Eric Schmidt's lawsuits against the schools. Stick around. We're going to have a little bit of fun. So for this episode, I had a chat schedule that just didn't happen. That's just part of part of the podcast. Sometimes folks have other things that come up. Sometimes they forget. Uh, you know, these things occur. Uh, so I had something ready that I wasn't sure if I was going to do, but I decided, you know what? Let's let's just go ahead and do it. Let's pivot to it. Uh, we got snow days happening all around us. We're thinking about school anyway because of that. And so I thought, why don't I go through this petition? from Eric Schmidt, our attorney general, who's actually just a Senate candidate, but is still getting paid for a job that he's not, doesn't seem to really be doing. Uh, but but here he is filing these lawsuits, 45 lawsuits against these schools. And so so I pulled one up. I pulled up a petition, one of the ones that he's filed. And I'm going to go through it here. Uh, I'm actually going to do this kind of live. I've I've kind of skimmed it, but I haven't really gone through the petitions themselves yet. So you're going to, this is a journey. I'm going to take you on a journey with me. I don't know. Maybe this will be a lot of fun and and maybe this will be a good thing. Maybe you'll enjoy it. Maybe this episode will completely suck. Uh, I don't know. Let me know. (laughs) Let me know if you like this or not. You and me uh, having this chat, this conversation. So, uh, you know, maybe you'll want to follow along. Well, I went ahead and I put a uh, link to a PDF of the petition for one of the school districts, my local school district. I went ahead and put a link of the PDF into the show notes. So if you're not driving, uh, you can pull that up and you can follow right along and you can do this with me. If you are driving, don't do that. That would be a bad idea. But if you're a passenger in the car, you you know, that's fine. No, no problem. Unless you're supposed to be navigating, in which case the driver is depending on you. Get back to what you're supposed to be doing. All right. So let's dive into this beauty here. So this is actually filed in uh, the 17th Judicial Circuit of Missouri. That's where I uh, personally live and has tw- uh, case number on it, 22JO-CC00018. So that means it was filed in year 22 in Johnson County. Uh, it's a civil case, and it's the 18th civil case filed in that uh, year. So let, let's run through it here. It's a petition. Now, normally, for those of you who are not lawyers, and if you are a lawyer listening to this, uh, you're either going to totally agree with me or totally disagree with me. Uh, but, you know, reasonable minds can differ, right? They, that's what we learned in law school. Uh, if you're not a lawyer, just some, a really quick kind of setting. So typically in a petition or, you know, a, an opening court pleading of some kind, you would identify what it is with a heading, and then you would set out the facts that are sort of common to all your counts or that are generally going to be agreed upon. A lot of times that's something that's uh, fairly common, uh, and set out kind of some basic things that, you know, th- there's really no argument about. Um, you might set out some legal standards, right, uh, as well. But you're usually going to do that first. You know, who are the parties? This is who the petitioner is. This is who the defendant is. This is where they are. This is why this case can be brought here, okay? It's kind of some really basic building blocks of what the case is, because that's that's what the law is about, right? You have to start from the ground up, and you have to build a foundation of your case of admissible evidence, and you got to start with who the people are, who the parties are, why you're allowed to sue them, why you're allowed to sue them where you're suing them, right? You have to start by proving all of those things, and a lot of that stuff gets agreed to because there's no argument about it, you know, not a real argument about it, but sometimes that is an argument, so you usually start with that stuff. That's not what they started with in these lawsuits at all. (laughs) In fact, uh, the first seven paragraphs of the lawsuit is a letter, essentially. It's another diatribe, if you will, uh, from the attorney general that has nothing to do with the actual laws or the facts of the case. It's just diatribe. That's all it is. So the first paragraph says school districts do not have the authority to impose at their whim public health orders 
for their school children. That is doubly true when the public health order, in this case, face masks, creates a barrier to education that far outweighs any speculative benefit. So let's, let's break this down, okay? School districts do not have the authority to impose at their whim public health orders for their school children. So what that suggests is that as long as they don't do it at their whim, then they can actually uh, impose public health orders, that they do have that authority. Grammatical issues aside, it's wrong. It's just an incorrect statement. They do. They have all kinds of authority. They have statutory authority. They have case law authority. There's a ton of authority. And then that is doubly true. Folks, That talk about some 1984 Orwell stuff, doubly true. It, if something is true, it's just true. And in a legal setting, that's especially important. You don't prove something doubly. It either is or it isn't. It's called a light switch issue. They either have authority or they don't have authority. They don't doubly not have authority. They just do have authority or they don't have authority. It's that simple of a thing. This is all one of my favorite words. This is superfluous. It's unnecessary. It's uncalled for. We don't need it. And yet there it is. That's the that's just the first paragraph. The first part of the petition. Part one. Part two. Number two, instead, school districts only have the power to issue those health rules that the General Assembly provides them, and the General Assembly did not give school districts the authority to condition in-person attendance on compliance with an arbitrary mask mandate. Yet again, we have these words, arbitrary mask mandate. What if it wasn't arbitrary? What if it was based on science and reason and debate? That's not arbitrary. If a school board has a reasoned debate about the decision that they want to make, that's not arbitrary. That undercuts the entire portion of that paragraph, which again is just an argument. It's not even an actual proper paragraph for a pleading. It's just an argument. It's the kind of thing you would say in an opening statement. It's the kind of thing you might say in a cross-examination, the kind of thing you might use for a deposition, the kind of thing that you might use in a closing argument. It's argument. That's it. Paragraph three, that makes sense. See what I mean? It's just, a, it's a letter. You could take the numbers out and just read the thing. That makes sense, starts number three. The theory that mandatory masking in schools prevents the spread of COVID-19 by preventing the transmission of its causative agent, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, has no empirical, wrong, or rational basis, wrong, and rejects prin basic principles of sound public health decision-making, medical science, and statistical analysis. Wrong, wrong, wrong. But again, we still haven't gotten to any legal action here. This is just three lines of argument. Number four, indeed, far from providing any benefit, masking students imposes positive harms, physical, emotional, and developmental on school children. Positive harms. It imposes positive harms. So what they're trying to do with this lawsuit is they are trying to say that putting a mask on a kid's face has a direct impact on their physical, emotional, and developmental well-being. That's where they're taking this. Number five, since school districts lack the power to impose mask mandates, again, th that's wrong, like the one at issue here, decisions about masking of children to prevent the spread of COVID-19 are reserved to parents, not to school districts. That follows from the fundamental truth that, quote, the child is not the mere creature of the state. Those who nurture him and direct his destiny have the right, coupled with the high duty, to recognize and prepare him for additional obligations. That is a quote from a citation from 1925. Dug that case out from 1925. Number six, Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt seeks to protect the welfare of Missouri, see, there we go, of Missouri's children and the liberty and constitutional rights of the people of Missouri. So this is a lawsuit about children's welfare and liberty and constitutional rights of the people of Missouri. Mm-hmm. Number seven, Attorney General Schmidt brings this action to prevent unlawful, unconstitutional, arbitrary, capricious, and unreasonable conduct by the defendant. So unlawful, 
unconstitutional, arbitrary, capricious, and unreasonable. That's a lot of things to prove. A lot. I mean, I I think they're going to have trouble proving all of those things. Maybe they should have stuck with just, just the things they can actually prove. All right, then we get to the actual legal stuff, jurisdiction and venue. Okay, number eight, number nine. Uh, court has jurisdiction, venue is proper in this court. These are very common and normal to see in a, in a lawsuit. Then we get to parties. Number 10, plaintiff, state of Missouri, is a sovereign state of the United States of America. Number 11, Eric Schmidt is the 43rd Attorney General of the United States of Missouri. Attorney General Schmidt is authorized to, quote, institute in the name and on behalf of the state all civil suits and other proceedings. Okay, this is totally unnecessary. This is so remarkably self-aggrandizing. It's just totally unnecessary. Parties, plaintiff is the state of Missouri represented by Attorney General Eric Schmidt pursuant to the authority of Section 27.060 RSMO. Boom. Done. One paragraph. He's got not just two paragraphs. He's spelling out his authority under the statute. He's quoting the entirety of this little, of this portion within the case. You just don't need to do that. It's it's just unnecessary. Number 12, Attorney General Schmidt sues to vindicate Missouri's sovereign interest in controlling the exercise of sovereign power, my God, over individuals and entities within its borders. Missouri's sovereign interest in ensuring the enforcement of Missouri law within Missouri's borders and Missouri's quasi-sovereign and parents' patriae interest in the freedom, health, and physical, phys- <laughs> physical, psychological, educational, and economic well-being of a significant segment of its populace. So not everybody. We're not worried about all them kids, just some of them. This interest includes, but is not limited to, preventing the spread of COVID-19 virus within the state, as well as protecting the health and welfare of the state's residents from arbitrary, capricious, unreasonable, unlawful, and unlimited, uh, and ultimately harmful public health policies. I told you I'm reading this live, so there's going to be some. It's going to be some errors. Apologize. Um, that's just gobbledygook. It's just gobbledygook. This is under the heading of parties. None of that is necessary. At all. At all. It's maybe argument. It's 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 kind of a it's almost material for a, a an opening statement. Um, but it definitely doesn't belong here. It's totally unnecessary. Number thirteen, Attorney General Schmidt sues to vindicate Missouri's sovereign interest in ensuring that its political subdivisions do not exercise authority vested in them under state law in a fashion that violates the Missouri Constitution or Missouri law. So now we're getting into issues of standing. And that that is that's probably why he's laying this stuff out because he realizes that there's not actually a harm to the people who are suing and so there may not be any standing here for him to actually do what he's trying to do. 14 Attorney General Schmidt sues to vindicate Missouri's interest in ensuring that the children of the state receive an appropriate education. What about his own child who's in a school that has a mask rule? Hmm. Just some of the kids. Number 15, Defendant Warrensburg, R6 school district. That's the one that I pulled this from. Uh, these are all basically the same, but I'm, they're, they're in here. Is responsible for providing a free public education to the children within its district. It is a public school district and is a political subdivision of the state of Missouri. Okay. Great. That was one of the most rational statements of the entire thing so far. Factual allegations. Plaintiff incorporates. That's normal. You you, you incorporate everything in that you said prior. Uh, and then we get into the district's mask mandate. So this may be a little more specific to uh, this particular district as opposed to uh, other districts. So... Uh, on August 17, 2021, the district school board approved a mandatory masking requirement for all of its schools in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which was put out in approval for the safe return. Paragraph 18, prior to January 1, 2022, a statewide emergency declaration under Chapter 44 was in effect relating to COVID-19 in Missouri's Paragraph 19, the district's mandatory masking requirement is a tier threshold system 
so that uh, when in plan A, a 3% of the total number of staff and students, okay, I know this because it's, it's my local school. So they put in a 3% rule that said once we get to 3% in the building, we're putting in masks at that point in time uh, until it comes back down under that number. So that's that's number 19. So that's an actual, it's a factual statement. Number 20, on information and belief, the district does not permit many exceptions to the mask mandate. The exceptions it does provide are for certain disabilities and accommodations are provided only on a case-by-case basis. I'm not going to make any direct comment on that because I could potentially be uh, a witness uh, for that. Um, But from a factual standpoint... I'm not sure how that actually supports their case. Number 21, while the mask mandate does not define what constitutes a mask on information and belief, cloth masks suffice and are the dominant method of compliance. Okay. So if it wasn't a cloth mask, what if they changed it? What if it was N95s? What if they provided the N95s? Would that change it? Would it? Would it really? On information and belief, number 22, the district also established a set of quarantine and isolation rules. Number 23, on January 6, 2022, the district revised its safe return plan but maintained its masking requirement. Number 24, the school board did not vote for and or approve of the mask mandate within 30 days after its issuance. Number 25, on information and belief, that mask requirement is still purportedly in force in substantively the same form as in August. Number 26, on information and belief, the mask mandate does not have an end date. So these are all just wrong. Um, But, you know, whatever. They'll figure it out. Just a quick break here to remind you, you can find out information about all of our podcasts with heartlandpod.com. There's a link to all of our shows and information there, along with a link to our Patreon account. If you want to help us change the conversation, you can click that link. And for five bucks a month, you can join us, get a couple of extra shows every month. And plus our blog posts. I know I uh, talked to Rachel earlier today. She's hard at work at a couple. Follow us on Twitter at the Heartland Pod, Facebook Heartland Pod and Twitter, the Heartland Pod. And now back to me reading through Eric Schmidt's ridiculous lawsuit. Number two, public health decision making. Uh, Wow. So I'm definitely not going to read all of these because it's just, look, (laughs) in part two, number 27, 28, 29, and 30, he's just laying out standards for public health decision making, which is really interesting considering just yesterday the director of public health that had been appointed by Governor Parson, did not receive his confirmation after his religious affiliation was questioned. But here we are with our attorney general talking about public health, even though the state can't get a public health director because the last guy was a complete creep show. And the guy that we had now that by all accounts seemed to be qualified for the job got run out on a rail because he wouldn't swear fealty to Dr. Bob Onder. Or Mike Moon. Christ. (sighs) Moving to part three. SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 characteristics. So this is a bunch of stuff about COVID-19. Hilariously, he cites to CNBC um, for information. Oh... And, oh, not only this, here you go. Here's the best part of this. In paragraph 34, Eric Schmidt is citing Anthony Fauci to help his case. He is citing a quote by Dr. Anthony Fauci and saying that it is a factually correct quote. Print that. Eric Schmidt agrees with Dr. Fauci. That's the, There we go. There's the title of the episode. Eric Schmidt agrees with Dr. Fauci. Prove me wrong. It's in your pleading. There it is. Number 35, regardless of the variant, COVID-19 is not a serious health risk for the vast majority of the population. (sighs) Number 36, it is likely that the vast majority of people in Missouri, vast majority means you don't know. 
Vast majority means you don't have numbers. Vast majority means you're guessing. Vast majority is a vague and ambiguous way to say, we don't know how many, but we're pretty sure it's most. Vast majority is a bunch of bullshit. Or bullshit, I guess, in this particular instance. Current evidence indicates that natural immunity is durable and protects against reinfection and severe health outcomes. Does it? Current evidence suggests that vaccine-mediated immunity, while inferior to natural immunity, provides protection against severe negative health outcomes for at least a season. So there you go. Not only does he agree with Dr. Fauci, he agrees that vaccines provide protection against severe negative health outcomes. Hmm. Furthermore, there's no evidence that children drive the spread of COVID-19. Bearing that out is evidence that schools are not sources of COVID-19 transmission outbreaks in the community, but rather transmission of COVID-19 in school reflects pattern of community transmission. Uh-huh. Yeah. So tell that to the schools that had to close because they didn't have enough staff, you buffoon. Number 38, part four now. Masks fail to provide adequate protection and offer a false sense of security. So at this point, we're not. This isn't even a legal case. This is this is so ridiculous. Now we we have sites to Dr. Scott Gottlieb on Face the Nation from CBS News. Um, this is about how this is an airborne illness, and that cloth masks aren't going to be enough. Um, yeah, guess what? We know that. You know how we know that? Because over time, with scientific understanding, we are able to now understand that the N95 is a much better way to actually stop the particles. You know what we didn't know when this first started? If that was true or not. Remember when this first started, we were wiping down our groceries before we brought them into the house? We were taking our shoes off, right? A lot of folks were doing this stuff. We didn't know how it spread. And then we found out that it doesn't spread that way, so we stopped wiping our groceries down. That didn't mean that it went away. That didn't mean that we didn't need to keep washing our hands. It doesn't mean you don't wash your vegetables when you bring them in. It just means you didn't have to Lysol your damn bags before you brought them out of the car. It didn't change the disease. It was our understanding of what it does that changed. Those are different things. They're different things. Number 39, same bullshit. Cloth and surgical masks are not effective at preventing the spread of COVID-19. Nobody's saying that they're not. So again, back to if the policies of the schools were to hand the kids an N95 mask and make them keep that N95 mask and make sure that they have one of those on them at all times, would that be fine? Because it seems to me that the crux of this lawsuit is built on the fact that cloth masks aren't as effective as N95 masks. Dude, nobody's arguing that. Everybody agrees with that now. People who are paying attention agree with that contention. They do. They agree with that. Nobody's arguing that point. And it doesn't prove your case anyway. 41, 41 paragraphs before we get to count one. On page seven of this lawsuit, count one starts on the 40, in the 42nd paragraph. Declaration that the mask mandate is void. They're asking the court to issue a ruling that the mask mandate is void under public policy. Mask mandate restricts access to schools or other places of public or private gathering or assembly because it limits access to schools to only masked individuals or to individuals who fall under an exception to the mask requirement. Yeah, so... Wearing a mask is not an inherent trait. It's not race. It's not sexual identity. It's not an inherent trait. It's not discrimination. A kid wearing a mask is not discrimination. Number 47 says the kids will be excluded from school property, face discipline, and may be sent home. Well, if they're excluded from school property, I hope they are being sent home. 
Otherwise, that's just irresponsible. But it won't be allowed in school. Maybe you're required to use virtual instruction. You know, I recall very recently somebody with a private institution in Missouri who's very heavily pushing school choice saying that virtual options were going to be just fine when kids' schools closed due to school choice. So it's fine for that, but it's not okay for mask purposes. Look, if a kid, if a kid's parents aren't going to have that child vaccinated and they're not going to mitigate the risk of that child spreading an illness, when they could, by the way, they could. It would be very easy to do it. The vaccine, they just give it out. You don't even need insurance. You just show up. You just take your kid in, say, this is my child. I would like you to give it a vaccine. They will say, okay, and they will give it a vaccine. And then when you say, how much for the vaccine? They will say, don't worry about it. You don't have to pay us for that. Isn't that unbelievable? And yet, and yet, and yet, it's not happening. It's <laughs> Instead, we're suing about mitigation efforts. Count two, mask mandate is unlawful. So now we're getting into the lawful issues. It shall be the general duty and responsibility of the Department of Health and Senior Services to safeguard the health of the people in the state and all its subdivisions. Yeah, except you don't want the director of DHSS because he's not willing to do the salute, right? Count three, the mask mandate is unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious. So we're back to that language. He used that in the letter before. Unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious. So, you, so by his own admissions here, he's going to have to prove all of these. And he's, he's, the reason he's doing that is because he's taking out a case law. And so I'm familiar with this phrasing, unreasonable, arbitrary, capricious, right, or unlawful, which he used earlier. Um, and they cite a case for that in here, which is, which is fine. But we know it's wrong. Right, We know that the decision is not arbitrary and capricious because we know that it is actually based on legitimate information, it, period. I mean, we know that. All of this is based on information and belief, on information and belief, on information and belief. So there's somebody who's feeding the attorney general. Maybe it's from the magical email portal, which, by the way, if you haven't checked that out over on Show Me Progress, Mike Burson has done a great job of breaking that stuff down. He did a, a, a 610 request, a sunshine request of the information uh, found in those emails, and uh, he's been going through that and breaking it down. It's worth looking at that. Show Me Progress. Uh, count for a violation of Missouri Constitution. <sighs> Conclusion is the prayer for relief. They're asking for the mask mandate to be declared unconstitutional, unlawful, and or ultra virus. Declare that the mask mandate is arbitrary, capricious, and reasonable and invalid. Declare that the mask mandate is prohibited under law and join the district and its officers, employees, and agents from enforcing the mask mandate. Grant relief by injunction, certiorari, mandamus, prohibition, or other appropriate action against the district and its offices. And our final judgment in plaintiff's favor on all counts in this petition and grant such other and further relief as the court deems just and proper under the circumstances. That was filed by the Attorney General's office. James S. Atkins was the attorney that actually put his name down on it on behalf of the office, along with Michael E. Talent and Todd A. Scott. They work for the office. So here's the thing. They allege that this is about the psychological well-being of the children. Far from providing any benefit, masking students imposes positive harms, physical, emotional, and developmental on school children. That's what it says in the first part of this lawsuit. But if you actually read through the whole thing, they're not actually pleading that. Because they know that they don't have any proof of that and that the standard to prove that would be too high. So what they're going for is the rulemaking process. This is 
a gobbledygook mismatched ridiculous attempt of an administrative law case. They're going after the administration, the rulemaking, the body that has the ability to deliberate and make rules. That's what they're going after. They're going after the authority. They're going after school boards. Why? That's the true million-dollar question here. Why are they going after school boards? Why? Well, because it's easy. Because school boards don't want to pay lawyers. Because school boards are full of volunteers who don't want to have to deal with this kind of thing and shouldn't have to deal with this kind of thing because it's ridiculous. It borders on harassment. It makes them prize. It makes them want to quit. It makes it easier to get people in those seats who will make radical, ridiculous decisions that are genuinely unconstitutional. People who would ignore the First Amendment and Fourth Amendment when dealing with schools. People who would turn schools into religious indoctrination centers. Public schools. Not private schools, public schools. That's the point of all this. It's not about masks. It's definitely not about the actual welfare of the children. We know that. We know it because we just went through the pleading. Not in one count, not one count is about child welfare. Not one. There are four counts in this lawsuit. Four counts. It's 12 pages long. It's got paragraph on paragraph on paragraph of gobbledygook to start it out. And they didn't spend one count, one half page, actually going after protecting the welfare of the kids. They didn't actually sue on that. They just put it in the beginning part because they know that that's the part that you're going to see on the Internet or on the news. They know that that's the part that people are actually going to read and understand. So they didn't put it in the actual pleadings because in that part, they lose. They'll lose the case. They're probably going to lose this case anyway. They're probably going to lose all these cases because this is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, keep it up out there. I know sometimes it gets really, really hard. And I know sometimes... You can look at all of it and go, how do we pick what's important? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know that what we're doing is always the right way to do it. I don't know that what we're doing is always the right answer. I don't know that we're picking the best stories every single time. But we're going to keep doing it, and we're going to keep working at it, and we're going to keep pushing at it. Because as long as this kind of lawsuit is out there, as long as this kind of power is in the hands of somebody who's willing to use it simply to feather his own bed so that he can try to beat a disgraced ex-governor and a man who we only know his name because he pointed a gun at a bunch of protesters. Somebody's got to be doing it. Somebody has to. Be safe. Stay warm. The Heartland Pod is a production of Midmap Media, LLC. Follow us on Twitter with at the Heartland Pod. With email, you can reach us, heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com, online with heartlandpod.com, subscribe, and please sign up for our Patreon with patreon.com slash heartlandpod. Become a podhead or an official podgressive today and unlock all of our content. See you at the next show.